Well, good morning. Certainly good uh, to be able to be back in chapel. Yesterday we began by, by talking about the reality and the fact that God has a calling on your life. And it was while I was a camper here that God began to reveal my calling. In fact, as I said, it was just out that window and down that way a little bit that I distinctly heard God's voice speaking to me about serving Him with my life. And, and I was very shocked and very surprised. And, and in many ways, I thought maybe God had the wrong person. It was a bonfire. It was dark. I, I, I really thought, you know, it'd be very easy for God to get us mixed up, right? I mean, it, and, and we were sitting close together. It, it, it probably, maybe He was speaking to the person next to me. And I didn't hear. I had a lot of questions. And, and in many ways, I resisted what God was speaking to me, and, I, and I, there were probably a lot of reasons, but some of them were because I felt inadequate, I felt overwhelmed, and I felt unqualified. Right? Inadequate, overwhelmed, and unqualified. Today we're going to continue our journey with Moses, and to pick up, uh, we were in Exodus chapter 2 when we left off yesterday, and we were in a portion of the story where it had been a very, very, very long time that, first of all, the Hebrew people had been enslaved by Pharaoh. Their lives had been increasingly be becoming more and more burdened and difficult. Moses, if you'll remember, has been spared by God supernaturally as a baby. He's been raised in Pharaoh's home, but at the age of 40, he commits murder, uh, thinking that it would, it would bring a, a, a following among his people, the Hebrews, and that through that somehow... He would be their deliverer and their rescuer. But now, 40 years have passed. Moses fled to Midian. And he's living in the wilderness. He's now a shepherd, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. And we're going to see today that God is going to put a call on Moses' life. That call was there. Moses had a sense of that when he was a younger man. But we're going to see that for most, most likely that Moses has completely let go of the idea that God might call him to do something significant on behalf of his people. But notice Genesis 2 verse 24 where we left yesterday. God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant. Remember that word remembered is a word that meant he was about to act on the basis of his covenant relationship with his people. That God had made certain promises to his people. And when God makes a promise he always fulfills it. Right? God never goes back on His promises. How many of you have ever made a promise and didn't keep it? Right? All of us. And most of us, I would imagine, when we made that promise, we, we may have even really, really intended to keep it. Right? We wanted to keep it, but maybe we weren't able, maybe we forgot, maybe something happened. Now, occasionally there are people who make promises with no intention right, of keeping it. But God neither does that, nor does He forget and so God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God saw the Israelites, and he took notice. And so, now God is about to do something. And he is going to, to come to Moses in a very familiar passage, right? We're going to look at in Exodus chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Exodus chapter 3 Verses 1 through 12. It's the, it's the scene where we encounter Moses and the burning bush. Right? Very, very familiar story that most of us learned when we were growing up. But in this, we're going to see that, that, that God is going to put a call on Moses' life. And Moses is going to have a very, a very heartfelt, very significant question for God. But God is not going to answer that question. Sometimes... We ask questions of God, and He doesn't answer. And we often wrestle, well, God, why didn't you answer my question? And there could be multiple reasons, but today we're going to see that Moses is really asking the wrong question. And so God is going to lead him to the right question and the right answer instead of answering his question. So, and, and it's really the answer to that question that is going to be the key for all of us about whether we're going to say yes to following God with our call on our lives. So let's begin in Genesis chapter 3 uh, and just look at verse 1 to start. It says, Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. 
And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. This is the same place where Moses will receive the Ten Commandments later on in his life. And Moses is there with the sheep. He's been a shepherd for a long time. Right? Taking care of sheep is what he does now. He's near 80 years old. Right? And this is his life. And so he's out there, and it says in verse 2, that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. And Moses looked, and he saw that the bush was on fire, but was not consumed. So Moses is out there with his sheep, and he, he notices a bush that was on fire. And, and if we would study this, we'd say it's not that uncommon in the region that he was that there might be a fire, or there might be shrubs or a bush on fire. But as he looks at this, he notices something really weird, really strange. The bush is burning, but it's not burning up. Right? There's no damage to the bush. And so Moses is going to be intrigued. And we are told right here that this is the angel of the Lord or the messenger of the Lord. And we're going to see that this is not an angel in the sense of a created being, but this is God himself appearing. We call these theophanies or Christophanies. Right? This is the second person of the Trinity, Right, appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament before he came as, as a baby later on and grew up and lived and died for us. But he always existed. And so here he's going to appear to Moses. And so look at verse 3. This, this crazy sight. Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? And so Moses saw something really weird. And he's like, I got to check this out. I got to figure this out. I got to see this. And so, notice verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And he answered, here I am. Now, you have to imagine that as he's approaching this bush and all of a sudden he hears this loud, booming voice call out his name, right? That his heart rate started to pick up a little bit. But it is interesting. He hears his name and he answers. He says, here I am. And he is going to now encounter something very powerful. So he hears his name. And I think it's significant for us to remember that, that God had not forgotten Moses. Right? I'm sure that in these 40 years uh, of taking care of sheep for his father-in-law, that his mind went through a lot of mental loops. Have your mind, has your mind ever gone through some mental loops? Right? Where you get stuck on some thoughts. What do you think might have been going through Moses' mind these 40 years? Any, any thoughts? Any guesses? What do you think might have been going through Moses' mind? Somebody help me out. He was thinking about his people, right? I'm sure for those 40 years he's thinking about my family, my people are back in Egypt suffering. Is God going to do anything? Absolutely. What else might he have been thinking about? Yes. His what? Is Pharaoh still, still after me? Does he still want to kill me? Absolutely. In the back. Yes. Maybe he's wishing he'd stayed in Egypt. He's probably wishing that he hadn't done what? Oh, if I only hadn't done that. Have you ever had a moment where you just say, ah, oh, if only I had, I wish I hadn't done that. How could I have done that? I'm sure all these thoughts, right, are swirling through his mind for 40 years. And maybe the thought is that God is done with me. And he hears his name. God has not forgotten him. Notice verse 5. Do not come closer is the next thing he hears. Take off your sandals off your feet. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. So the next thing he hears, he says, Moses, stop. Right? Social distancing. Are you with me, right? He says, don't come any closer. Why? Because God is holy. Right, and we just sang about His holiness, one of my favorite hymns, right, because it reminds us that our God is holy. He is morally perfect, He is pure, and He dwells in unapproachable light. Now, by the grace of God, He has made a way for us as sinful people to draw near to Him, right? And the way that that is is because His Son, Jesus, was a sacrifice for our sins, and He shed His blood to pay the penalty and the price of sin, and then He has purified us. He's redeemed us. And so we now, the Bible says, can approach God with confidence and boldness. Not, not with carelessness or without reverence, but we can approach Him because He's made us pure through Christ. And we can approach Him. But God says, Moses, don't come any closer because I'm holy and you are not. Then He says to take off your sandals. 
right? It's a sign of humility. It's a sign of, of respect, right? In their culture and in some, many cultures today, you take your shoes off when you go in the house, right? How many of you have a mom that makes you take your shoes off when you come in the house, right? Take your shoes off. Don't track all that dirt in here, right? And it's a sign, again, the shoes would have collected all the impurities of, of, of the things you stepped on. And so God is pure. And so take off your sandals, for this is holy ground. Don't come any closer. But not only is God a holy God, notice verse 6. God then continued. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So God is holy, but notice he's also relational. Right? He says, I'm the God of your father. I'm the God of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am a personal God who knows your ancestors, who knows your people, and who knows you. Right? It is amazing that we are offered a relationship with God that is both marked by reverence and relationship. Right? We both, there's reverence in, in our utter awe and respect of who God is, His holiness, His beauty, His perfection. But then He also invites us to know Him relationally. To have a living relationship whereby we know Him and we experience that relationship where we can speak to Him and hear His voice, where we can experience His love and His care and His goodness and His grace and His mercy. And then the Lord said in verse 7, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries because of their oppressors and I know about their sufferings. Right? Remember He said, one of the things that might have been going through Moses' mind is what's going on with my people, right? What's going on with my family, my ancestors. And God reminded him, Moses, I haven't forgotten my faithful covenant. I hear the prayers of my people. I see their suffering. I see their oppression. I know about it. Right? And I, I just want you to know, God knows about you. I know we all deal with a lot of stuff in life. We talked about hopelessness yesterday and how life sometimes leaves us feeling hopeless. And sometimes we go through dark and difficult and painful things. But I want you to know that when you're in those places, know that God sees you. He knows and He cares. Let's go on to verse 8. God says, I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the territory of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And the Israelites' cry for help has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. And I sort of imagine at this moment that Moses' heart was filled with a sense of joy and excitement. Right, as he hears God say, I'm going to do something. And remember, Moses probably always thought he was going to be the one to do it. But he knows that's gone. Right? He messed up. And he, his life is, is now just going to be lived in obscurity in the middle of nowhere taking care of sheep. But he rejoices, I believe, in his heart. God's going to do something for his people. He's going to rescue them. He's going to redeem them. He's going to bring them out of Egypt and back to the land that he promised and gave to Abraham. And his joy lasts for about three seconds. Because notice the next verse. Therefore, go. Moses is like, who? Right? He says, I am sending you to Pharaoh. And remember, one of the things that we said that may have been swirling around in Moses' mind is what? Does Pharaoh still want to what? Does Pharaoh still want to kill me? Am I still the one in man? Now we know from the text of Scripture it's a new Pharaoh, but... Moses may not know that, and he may not know that the new Pharaoh doesn't still, you know, saw the, the wanted poster down at the post office and was like, yeah, we got to get that. If that guy shows up, right, we're going to take care of him. He says, I'm going to send you, Moses, to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And so I'm sure Moses' heart rate is well north of 100 at this point. Are you with me? Right? Pounding. I'm sure his mind is racing. God, what is this? What are you asking? Right? No doubt that 40 years ago, Moses thought of himself as a deliverer and believed that God could use him and would use him. But now, that thought's so far gone. Notice the question that Moses has for God. Verse 11. But Moses asked God. Right? Look at verse uh, uh, 
uh, 11. He says, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? God, who am I? I know, I know you can do this. I know you can redeem your people. I, I don't doubt that, but who am I to do it? I'm not worthy. I really believe Moses, I'm not worthy to do this. I messed up. Right? I missed my chance. I'm not worthy. Right? I'm not worthy. You know, I, I wrestled with that when God, I felt God calling me. I said, God, I'm not worthy. I know the things I've done. I know the things I haven't done. God, I'm not worthy of this call. God, I'm not qualified. I, I, I remember, I don't like to get up in front of people and talk. So, not a good idea, right? I'm not able. And I think all these things were going through Moses' mind. I'm not worthy. I'm not qualified. I'm not able. But when God calls us to do things, right, and God has a call on your life, when God calls us to do things, it's not because we're worthy, right? It's because Jesus is worthy for us. It's not because we're qualified, it's because He qualified us and qualifies us. And it's not because we're able, it's because He is able, right? And God chooses to use people to accomplish His purposes. He doesn't have to, He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. He didn't need Moses. Right? God certainly could have freed his people without Moses' help. But God chooses to work through people. And he chooses to work through imperfect people. He chooses to work through people who have insecurities. We're going to go further into insecurities tomorrow. I know that none of you have any insecurities. But you might know someone who does. So we'll talk about those tomorrow. So you can help them. But he's wrestling with this, who am I, question. I wrestled with it. You probably wrestle with it. And we might think that God's going to give Moses what? Maybe a pep talk? Moses, my man, right? You got this, right? You can do this. I, I know you can do this. I, man, just, you got this, Moses. Don't worry about it. But instead of answering his question, instead of giving him a pep talk, instead he tells them what he really needs to know. It wasn't that he needed a self-esteem boost. In fact, his self-esteem was actually the problem because 40 years before, Moses thought he could do it his way on his terms. So notice verse 12. Here's God's answer. And it's not the answer that Moses is looking for. Moses is saying, who am I? And God says this, verse 12, I will certainly be with you. Moses, it isn't about who you are. It isn't about what you've done. It's about me. I will certainly be with you. And this will be a sign to you I, that I have sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. And when Moses hears that, that, that is like the most impossible thing that he can probably imagine or picture. Right? The whole... The whole Hebrew nation, the Israelites are all going to be here, worshiping, freed from Egypt, freed from Pharaoh's hand. God, that seems so impossible. And it should have been enough for Moses at this point, right? When, when God says, Moses, I'm going to be with you. Will we all agree that that should have been enough for Moses to say yes to God? Anybody? I, I think it should have been enough. right? When God called me, Right? My, my, my response should have been, well, God, if you're calling me, you're certainly able to do it. So, God, I trust you. Here am I. Lord, send me. I'm all yours. That should have been my response. But instead, for three years, I resisted God's call on my life. I resisted it because I didn't think I was qualified. I didn't think I was able. I didn't think I was worthy. I didn't want to do it. And God had to bring circumstances and situations into my life to point me back to Him. And God was patient, and He was faithful, and He kept calling. And for Moses, it's going to take some convincing. Right? For Moses, it's going to take some convincing. But for now, I want you to know this. God has a calling on your life. God has a purpose for your life. 
Now, there's some things that, that we know about God's calling on all of our lives. He's called you to know Him. Right? He has called you to know Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And every one of you is called by God to know Him. And He extends an invitation to you. Right? He says, I gave my Son. And the Son gave Himself willingly as a sacrifice for sin. And He bore the sin and the consequence of sin of mankind on the cross. He died and rose again from the dead. He appeared to his followers and he ascended to the Father where he sits at the right hand and he's coming one day in power and in glory to set this world in order once again. And in the meantime, he invites anyone and everyone to come to him, to be forgiven of their sin, to be redeemed, to be part of his kingdom and his family, to know his forgiveness and his grace, to know his presence to have a living relationship with himself. And if you've never responded to that call, I want you to, maybe God brought you here so that you would know that there's a God that loves you, a Savior who died for you, who rose from the dead and who invites you to himself to experience his grace and his mercy and his goodness and his love, to know him. So you are called to know God. You're called to worship God. We, we are called to be worshipers of God. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 talks about how we've been called out of darkness and into God's light so that we might proclaim His praises, that we would worship Him. We've been called to obey Him, to serve Him, and to follow Him. And so I want to challenge you while you are here to really wrestle with this question, God, what are you calling me to do? God, what's your call on my life? What's the direction? What, what is the, the thing that you are, are calling me to do with my life? And what I'm asking you to do is to give God your attention. Right? And this is a perfect place to do that, away from the distractions of, of everyday life, right? a place where you can come aside and have a lot of fun, where we can grow and learn and be stretched, which is what you know, we're, we're wanting to see happen in your life, is the talents and the gifts and the abilities God's given you. We want to we see them grow while you're here. That's why we ask you to practice two hours a day. That's why your, your faculty will push you and challenge you, right? because they know God's gifted you and called you, and they want to help you. But it's also a place for us to, to, to give our attention to God and to listen. And you may feel overwhelmed. You may wrestle with the I'm not worthy, qualified, or able. You may say, but my past, you know, what I've done, or my limitations, or my struggle, or my anxiety, or my depression, or my issue, or my family, or my situation. And God says, I see all of that. I know all about that. But you are mine, and I am calling you to serve me. There's a verse that God used powerfully to help me, and still to this day. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. And it simply says this, as the Apostle Paul is writing to the church, he says, the one who calls you is faithful. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I remember when I discovered that verse, it was so powerful, like, to hear God speaking through his word to me. He says, if God has called you, he'll be faithful. And he'll do it. Right? If God's called you to do something, he will enable you and empower you to do what he's asked you to do. And so all you have to do is to say yes to God. Listen, Moses was not called by God because of his perfect record. He didn't have a perfect record at all. He wasn't called by God because he had a long history of successful negotiation with dictators. Right? God didn't say, hey, that's my man right there. He's the great negotiator. Right? He's taking care of sheep. He talks to sheep. And that's about it. God did not call Moses even because he was an eloquent speaker. In fact, that's going to be one of Moses' objections. But God called him. He called me. And he's calling you. And so, I, I, I pray that, that while you're here, that God will do for you what he did for me and that you might have a burning bush moment. Now, I'm not expecting that you will literally see a bush on fire. And if you do, let your counselor know, okay? God doesn't speak in the same ways or do the same things all the time, but he does speak. Our God is a God who speaks. And so I'm praying that this, this week or the weeks that you're here will be a burning bush type moment where you'll say it was there on the campus of Cairn University, while I was at Chahi Summer School of Music, 2021, I heard God speak to me. I heard his voice. I heard his call on my life. And I said yes to him. 
So I'm just going to ask you today to say, God, would you speak to me while I'm here? Help me to hear your voice. Help me to know your will for my life. Let's pray together. Father, I, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace in our lives. I thank you for the, 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 the good news of the gospel. Father, I thank you that there is good news for all of us, that though we are sinful people who have all rebelled against you in our own way, that you have made a way for all of us to come back to you through your son, Jesus Christ, and that you have provided the means of redemption, the means of forgiveness through the blood of your son. And I pray that everyone here would know the forgiveness that you offer and to know the love that you want to pour into their lives the grace and the mercy and the goodness. And Father, I pray that, that every one of us while we are here would hear your call on our life. And Father, whether we are in school or whether we're faculty or staff, you may be calling us to something. So while we're here, would you give us ears that are willing to listen, eyes that are open to see, a heart that is ready to receive. And Father, I pray that you would speak and that you would call. And Father, I know that when you do, there will be feelings of inadequacy, feelings of, I'm not worthy, I'm not able, I can't do this, I don't want to do this. But Father, I pray that, that we would realize that it's not about us, that the, the real question isn't, who am I? But the real question is, who are you? So Father, help us to see you for who you are. And to realize that you are the God who calls, you are the God who is faithful, and you are the God who will accomplish your purposes for our lives. Father, I ask your blessing now over this day that's before us. Father, it's going to be a day filled with lessons, rehearsals, practice, laughter, fun, enjoyment, relationships. Father, I pray in all of it that we might encounter your presence. In all of it, we might find your goodness and your joy and that we would experience you together today. And we ask your blessing over this day in Jesus' name. Amen.